Class of 2009. I don't think I heard you. Class of 2009. First, I want you to stand up and wave and cheer your supportive family and friends. I'm sure you can find them out there. Show your love. It's a great honor for me to be here today. Now, wait a second. I know, that's such a cliché. You're thinking every graduation speaker here says that. It's a great honor. But in my case, it really is so deeply true. Being here is more special and more personal for me than most of you know. I'd like to tell you why. A long time ago, in this cold September of 1962, there was a Stevens co-op at this very university. That co-op had a kitchen with a ceiling that had been cleaned by student volunteers probably every decade or so. Picture a college girl named Gloria climbing up high on a ladder, struggling to clean that filthy ceiling. Standing on the floor, a young boarder named Carl was admiring the view. <laughs> and that's how they met. They were my parents. <laughs> so I suppose you could say I'm a direct result of that kitchen chemistry experiment right here in Michigan. My mom is here with us today. And we should probably go find that spot and put up a plaque on the ceiling that says, thanks, mom and dad. <laughs> Everyone in my family went here to Michigan. Uh, my brother, my mom, my dad, all of us. My dad actually got the quantity discount. He got all three and a half of his degrees here. His PhD was in communication science because they thought computers were just a passing fad in when he earned it 44 years ago. He and Mom made a big sacrifice for that degree. They argued at times over pennies while raising my newborn brother. Mom typed my dad's dissertation by hand. Kind of ironic, given it was a computer science dissertation. <laughs> this velvet hood that I'm wearing, this was my dad's. This diploma? Yeah. yeah. This diploma that I have here, just like the one you're about to get, this was my dad's. And my underwear? Oh, never mind, sorry. My father's father worked in the Chevy plant in Flint, Michigan. He was an assembly line worker. He drove his two children here to Ann Arbor, and told them, this is where you're going to college. I know, it sounds funny now. Both of his kids actually did graduate from Michigan. That was the American dream. His daughter, Beverly, is also with us today. My grandpa used to carry an alley-oop hammer, a heavy iron pipe with a big hunk of lead melted on the end. The workers made them during the sit-down strikes to protect themselves. When I was growing up, we would use that hammer whenever we needed to pound a stake or something into the yard. It is wonderful that most people don't need to carry a heavy blunt object for protection anymore. But just in case, I brought it with me. All right. My dad became a professor at Michigan State. <laughs> and I was an incredibly lucky boy. A professor's life is pretty flexible, and he was able to spend oodles of time raising me. Could there be any up better upbringing than a university brat? 
What I'm trying to tell you, this is way more than a homecoming for me. It's not easy for me to express how proud I am to be here with my mom, my brother, and my wife, Lucy, and with all of you at this amazing institution that is responsible for my very existence. I'm thrilled for all of you, and I'm thrilled for all of your families and friends as all of us join this great, big Michigan family I feel I've been a part of all of my life. What I'm also trying to tell you is I know exactly what it feels like to be sitting in your seat listening to some old gas bag give a long-winded commencement speech. Don't worry, I'll be brief. I have a story about following dreams. Or maybe, more accurately, it's a story about finding a path to make those dreams real. You know what it's like to wake up in the middle of the night with a vivid dream? And you know how if you don't have a pencil and pad by the bed, it will be completely gone by the next morning. I had one of those dreams when I was 23. When I suddenly woke up, I was thinking, what if we could download the whole web and just keep the links, and I grabbed a pen and started writing? Sometimes it's important to wake up and stop dreaming. I spent the middle of that night scribbling out the details and convincing myself it would work. Soon after, I told my advisor, Terry Winograd, it would take a couple of weeks for me to download the web. He, downloaded, he nodded knowingly, fully aware it would take much longer, but wise enough not to tell me. The optimism of youth is often underrated. Amazingly, at that time, I had no thoughts of building a search engine. The idea wasn't even on the radar. But much later, we happened upon a better way of ranking, and we made a really great search engine, and Google was born. When a really great dream shows up, grab it. When I was here at Michigan, I'd actually been taught how to make dreams real. I know it sounds funny, but that is what I learned in a summer camp converted into a training program called Leader Shape. Yeah, we got a few out there. Their slogan is to have a healthy disregard for the impossible. That program encouraged me to pursue a crazy idea at the time. I wanted to build a rapid, personal rapid transit system on campus to replace the buses. Yeah, you're still working on that, I hear. <laughs> it was a futuristic way of solving our transportation problem. I still think a lot about transportation. You never lose a dream. It just incubates as a hobby. Many things people labor hard to do now, like cooking, cleaning, and driving, will require much less human time in the future. That is, if we have a healthy disregard for the impossible, and actually build the solutions.